pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus this morning, I pray that uh, we would rise, that we would rise up from where we're at and surrender ourselves to you and allow you in this moment in time, Lord, to do with us what you desire to do. Lord, we've been gifted with so many things in the past. We have this moment, but we have no guarantee of the future. And, and Lord, I pray that we would do in this time, in the time that you give us, Lord, what you've given us to do. That we would make our lives matter, that we would be focused, that we would not waste days, that we would be people that are intentional about not wasting opportunities, but being faithful to them and realizing how they are a gift from you. Father, I pray this morning that you would use your word to speak to our hearts, that by your Holy Spirit, you would draw us to yourself. And, and God, that you would be our teacher, that, that we would decrease so that you increase in our lives. And Lord, that we would just allow you in these moments to say to us anything that you want to say to us, and we would answer affirmative, that we would allow you to have your way. God, thank you for just the privilege to open your word and to give you this time and to give you ourselves and to look forward to it with anticipation that we're here for a reason. That, Lord, it's not coincidence, it's providence that you brought us here. And, Lord, I pray that in this time you'd be glorified, that you'd be magnified, that, Lord, when we leave here, we would, we would be able to testify of what you've done, what, how you use the time for your good and for your glory. Lord, we offer ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your uh, copy of God's Word, turn, if you will, to the book of Esther in the Old Testament. And as you do, uh, I'll uh, encourage you, please pray for uh, Brent. Brent is under the weather. And I've said in the other two services, I worked up a good joke about it, okay? Uh, Brent's so tall, he can't get under a lot of things, but he is under the weather this morning. Isn't that good? Hey, this was the best laugh I got from any of the three services. I thought it was good. But uh, I know uh, Rhonda's here, and uh, I know my wife rubs my feet and takes care of me when I'm not feeling well, and I'm sure she has done that, and she's just wore out from tending to Brent's needs. As you turn to Esther uh, chapter 4, we're going to... Uh, kind of journey through the whole account of Esther and and what it's all about. And I'll uh, allude to the whole chapter kind of and, and several things concerning the story of Esther. And I hope you've read it. If you've never read the book of Esther, please do. It's 10 short chapters. You could read it in just a few minutes. And I promise you, if you read the background before you read it, you'll be blessed and, and God will greatly use it in your life no matter what it is that you're going through. As you think about that and you, you turn there, uh, I want to share a story with you. A few weeks ago, our granddaughters from Springfield came up and spent a few days with Tammy and I. And our granddaughter Addie is seven and our other granddaughter Leah is younger. And um, uh, Leah, Addie, Addie's so sweet like me. And uh, Leah is, is our tornado. She is a terror like her grandmother. And uh, I mean, she is just a terror. And uh, I love, and that's what I love about her. I mean, she just uh, is that kind of fun. But anyway, uh, so I did something that I probably knew I shouldn't do, but I did. Tammy had to work on Friday, so I volunteered to babysit uh, Addie and Leah. Which I'm not a babysitter. I'm not good at that. But uh, I thought, oh, I can get by one day. And so I uh, got up on Friday morning, and after Tammy went to work, I took them to Hy-Vee, and we got biscuits and gravy, and we went to Walmart and bought toys and candy and things like that. And everything was going good. Went home and got them all settled. And Leah is just this type. That, uh, she, she just does this. Uh, anytime she's at home or wherever she feels comfortable, she'll, she'll just walk in, and immediately she takes off all her clothes. And uh, she she just goes down to her underwear and so Leah just walked in took off her clothes and and she just plays all day we got along great it was a great day and uh, it came to the end of the day Tammy was getting off at five o'clock and and uh, Leah had spent the day having fun in her underwear and uh, uh, I got this call from one of the contractors that needed to meet with me down at the new building and they needed to meet with me right then and I said okay I'll be right down and so uh, 
I, I knew Tammy was getting off, and so I, I called and I said, hey, hey, Tammy, you're going to have to meet us uh, down at the building, and we'll switch cars, and you can, you can take the girls back home, but I don't have time to wait for you to get home. And so I, I told Daddy, I said, come on, get in the truck, let's go, and I got her in her car seat. I said, come on, Leah, let's go, and she said, no, I'm not going. And uh, I mean, she just wanted to stay there and play in her underwear. And so uh, uh, finally, I just picked her up and put her in the car seat just in her underwear, and I said, you're going. And so off we went uh, with the... Uh, uh, me and the two girls and Leah in our underwear in the back seat and uh <laughs> And so uh, we drove we drove down here, and Tammy met us. And I said, "Tammy, Liz in underwear in her back seat, and we don't have time to get her. I didn't have time to argue with her to get her dressed or anything. Just get in there and take them home. You're not going to be able to go anywhere or anything." And so she did that. And on the way home, Tammy tells me later that Leah in the back seat says, "Grandma, Papa's got a problem." <laughs> and she said, "I don't know what that problem is." And, and here, here's the thing. She did not understand. My problem was that time was critical. And she didn't grasp it. And if there's anything that I hope that you grasp today, it's this. Time is critical. And I hope that you'll realize the value of a moment. The value of time. The value of opportunities. The value of seasons. The value of, of God-given moments that we can never recapture again if we don't grab them. In Esther, it's a unique story and it's such a beautiful story because of the way God used Esther in, a, in her position. She had grown up an orphan. Her older cousin Mordecai took her in and raised her. They were both Jews. They were in the land in, in, in Persia, in the empire of Persia, where they had been taken away from their homeland in, in uh, Israel to uh, the empire of Persia because God's people had rebelled and they had forsaken God and they'd walked away from God and so God judged them with 70 years of captivity. That time had come to an end and some of the Jews were now going back to their homeland. But there were, there were still some 15 million Jews in the Persia Empire. Through some very evil acts that were done, a decree went out from the king that all of those 15 million Jews that still existed in that land should be killed and annihilated. That would include Mordecai and Esther. Esther, we find her in the fourth chapter of the, uh, of the book of Esther in a unique position. She is now the queen next to the king of Persia, which makes her the most, most powerful woman in the world. She's the queen next to the king. And here's how she got there. You say, how did a Jewish woman who was an orphan get to be queen next to the king of Persia? Here's how she did it. The king had decided he wanted a new queen. And so uh, he, he set up these, these, uh, these guidelines to select the, the new queen that would be next to him. And it was basically a beauty contest. And all these hundreds of women went before the king with, and they had the opportunity to go through all their beauty treatments and everything else. But they would be brought before the king and the, and the king would decide who he wanted to be the queen. Esther was in that competition. She was in that beauty contest. And the Bible says that she didn't even put on makeup. And she still won the beauty contest. Which tells us Esther was drop-dead gorgeous. She was beautiful. Of all those hundreds of people, she stood out before the king without even wearing any makeup. Now, you all know my theory. I don't think a little paint ever hurt the old barn. And so it never, uh, it never hurts to put on some makeup. But uh, Esther didn't use it. And so she still won. And she became the queen. Now she's in a position... Where if anybody could help out those Jews who were going to be killed, it would be her. And so in Esther chapter 4, we find this communication going back between Mordecai and, and Queen Esther. 
Mordecai can't get to her. And so there's a messenger going between. And I want us to read from verse 13 and following uh, the final part of, of that communication that was going back and forth. The Bible says that Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I want us to see from this story, I want us to look at it, at kind of three different scenes that are taking place, three different things that are happening in this account with Esther. First of all, I want you to notice the outcry of the people. When the decree went out from the king that all the Jews were to be killed, you can imagine what that did to them when they heard the news that all of our people, ourselves, were, were going to die. And verses 1 through 3 tell about their, their reaction when they hear the news. They, they clothe themselves in sackcloth and ashes. They're, they cry out desperately. They're broken. They're, hum, uh, they're, they're humble. They're, they're crying out to God, God, please do something. You see the outcry of the people. And here's why I wanted to include just this part in this message. Because there just may be someone that's here today that maybe you're trying to live for the Lord. You're trying to do what God wants you to do. You've tried to walk out your faith and trust in Christ. But you've been going through some stuff. You've been going through some, some uh, hard trials in your life. And things have happened. And maybe you even come here today with a broken heart. I want you to understand, these were God's people. These were God's people. These were his Jews. They, they were the Israelites that were uh, uh, going to be annihilated, which gives us a reminder. Even God's people are going to go through some stuff. You can, you can live for the Lord. You can be faithful to the Lord. You can, you can strive to do everything that he wants you to do. And still, you're going to go through some storms in life. Here's what I can tell you. I say it all the time. You're either in a storm, you just came out of a storm, or hang on, there's another storm around the corner because life is full of storms. It's going to happen. If it's not one thing, it's what? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, don't think it's strange when, God, when you as God's people go through fiery trials. It's going to happen. But here's the reminder we see in, this, in the book of Esther. All through the book of Esther, it's only one of two books in all the Bible. And I'm not going to tell you what the other one is. You've got to read your Bible. Uh, uh, it's only one of two books in all the Bible where the name God is not mentioned. You'll never find any mention of God in the book of, uh, of Esther. But what you will see is his hand, is his work, and, the, and the, the, his, his activity as he works behind the scenes. And here's a reminder for you that are going through trials and tribulations. And you're, you're just going through some hard stuff in your life. You're, you're enduring some storms. Here's a reminder. You may be at that place that David was in Psalm 13 where he cried out, Oh God, will you forget me forever? Where are you? You ever feel that? Where are you, God? I can't see you. I can't feel you. I can't hear you. Where are you, God? And just like in the book of Esther, you may not be able to see him, touch him, feel him, hear him, but he's there. And maybe God just brought you here today for that reminder to say to you, I'm still here. And I'm still working. I may be invincible. I may be invisible. But I'm also invincible. You remember that. You see, trials, they, they give opportunity for a couple things to happen. When trials come along, just like it did for God's people, the Jews, they cried out in desperation when this decree went out that, were, that they were going to be annihilated. You know what trials do? You know what storms do? They get our attention, right? Because sometimes when we're going through life and things are going smooth and, and uh, uh, everything's kind of going along, you know, we kind of take God for granted sometimes, don't we? 
And we kind of ease up and we coast spiritually. We can be guilty of that. But then the trial comes along and all of a sudden we, we realize, man, I need God. And we begin to cry out in desperation just like the children of Israel. God does that. He uses the trials to get our attention. It's kind of like those, those, um, those rumble strips along the, the highway that they've been, they put in uh, along the highways. When you veer off and you hit those rumble strips, you know what I mean? Tammy's convinced her for better traction and she just puts two tires on the side of the road and just drives down the road. And I said, Tammy, that's not what they're for. They're to remind you that you're veering off. Get off of them for I can sleep. And, and, and <laughs> it's the same way in life. When we begin to veer off, God will allow something to get our attention. But not only does He use it to get our attention, but He uses it to give opportunity to show what he can do. Listen, you're not going to have a testimony without a test. Do you realize that? That was a good, good thing right there. You should hear. You're not going to have a testimony without a test. How are you going to build a testimony? How are you going to build a faith? How are you going to be able to look back like David did when he went out to face his Goliath and say, man, I can, I can handle you. I've seen God and, and his activity as he, he delivered me from the mouth of the lions and the bears and, and, and all these other things. Listen, Goliath, you're no match for my God. How are you going to be able to say something like that if you don't go through the test? You're not going to have a testimony without a test. And the tests give God opportunity to work and to show what he can do. So there's the outcry of the people. But I want you to see the second thing. There's the orchestration of God. And what I love about the book of Esther is how in the book of Esther you, you see God just working through his providential ways to accomplish things that only he can do. He gives provision and information right when it's needed. He rescues his people when it looks like a hopeless situation. He, he, he deals with sin and evil right when it looks like that sin and evil are going to win. And he even uses, listen, it's so neat. He even uses the insomnia of the king to spare someone's life. Tell me God doesn't work. You know what my favorite thing is that I see in the book of Esther? It's how he puts just the right person in just the right place at just the right time to fulfill the right plan to accomplish what he wants to accomplish through that person's life, being Esther. It's accounts like this that remind us. You read the book of Esther and here's what you're going to learn. You're going to be reminded... There's no such thing as coincidence, it's providence. I hope you don't believe in coincidence and luck. I believe in the providence and sovereignty of an almighty God. I believe he's in control. I believe nothing is by accident. There's only appointments. Now, apply this, this truth of God just putting the right person in the right way and the right plan and the right place in, 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 in certain cir circumstances. Apply it like this. You know, we could, we could all relate to how there are times that God puts a special person in our life to do something. Maybe you had a flat tire and the right person comes along and they help you change the tire or whatever. And, and they, they are that special person that, that met you in your time of need and they helped you. But that's not the picture that we see in Esther. It's much bigger than this. God puts people in just the right place at just the right time to do just the right thing for a much bigger purpose. It's about his kingdom purposes. It's about what he's doing. It's about his great cause to reach a people that are crying out in desperation. Now, in verses 1 and 2, look at what happened. Mordecai could not get to the king. He couldn't get to Esther even. He, could, he couldn't plea his case and cry out for grace and mercy for his people, the Jews. And so he did the only thing he could do and he sat at the king's gate because, see, the king was protected from many bad news. If you brought bad news to the king, you're going to get your head chopped off because he was protected from all the bad news. And so Mordecai couldn't get to the king, couldn't get to Esther. And so he sat at the king's gate in sackcloth and ashes and he cried out. And, 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 and he just was broken before the Lord. Esther 
was inside the king's palace. You know what she was doing? Sitting on the king's couch eating bonbons. That's all she's doing. She had lost touch with the world. She had lost touch with the fact that, that her people, her 15 million people out there, were about to be killed and annihilated. But she was in the palace. And she'd lost touch. I thought about that this week and I thought, man, that describes sometimes God's people in the church. You know, we, we kind of come in here and we high-five each other and we, we've got our things going and we have our friendships and we have our, our, our things that we do in the church, our crowd that we hang around with. And the reality is sometimes we've lost touch with the cry of the world around us, with the desperation that exists out there and we're just kind of immune to it anymore. It's kind of like what the German church did during the annihilation of Jews under Hitler's rule. You know what history records that many of the churches did during that time when they heard the trains go by carrying those Jews off to their gas chambers? They turned up the music so they couldn't, couldn't hear the sound of the train. I think sometimes that's what we do. We just numb ourselves. Because we don't want to be bothered by the, the cry of the world. And that's where Esther was. She, she was out of touch. But she did, in verse 4, hear about Mordecai's actions. She heard that he was sitting at the king's gate and, and in sackcloth and ashes. So what did she do? She sent him some clothes and said, Mordecai, get a handle on yourself. Get up. Take care of yourself. Come on. But you see, God didn't want Esther to send Mordecai a change of clothes. God wanted Esther to get under the burden with Mordecai and do something to make a difference. And that's what he wants from us. So, in verses 7 through 9, Mordecai finally gets word sent to Esther about what's going on and why he's broken. But Esther still didn't recognize how vital her involvement was. So that's when we come to the words of Mordecai that we read a few moments ago. And he said, Esther, essentially he's saying, Esther, don't you see it? God puts you in the palace. God puts you up beside the most powerful man on the face of the earth to give you the up opportunity at just the right time to be used in such a time as this. You're the right person in the right place to do the right thing, to be instrumental for what God wants to do. And Esther was slow to realize it. She didn't realize that God had been orchestrating it for a purpose. What God had been doing in her life was for a much bigger purpose than her sitting on the couch eating bonbons. It was for the purpose of God using her to deliver his people. Now... Just like Esther, I want to ask you. I want to ask you individually, but I want to ask us as a church, as a life point as a church. Today, as you sit here today, what if all through your life, through everything you've been through, through all your circumstances, through all your upbringing, through your decisions, through your events that's happened to you, through the things that, that uh, you've gone through, through your failures even, through the way that you're wired. What if all of that as you're sitting here today was to get you ready for what God was about to do? What if it was so God could use you in some way in the bigger picture? Let me ask you, has God worked in your life has God worked in our lives as a, as a group, and, and as a church, and brought us together with our unique backgrounds, with our unique experiences, with our unique abilities and the ways that we're wired, and brought us together to accomplish something unique that could only be accomplished by this group of people for such a time as this. Do you think that's possible that God could be doing that? Not only is it possible, it's reality. It's exactly what God is doing. It's exactly what he's up to because listen, God has plans, God has purposes, God has, has things that he wants to do through this group of people and through your individual lives. You ever think about the people that God puts in the church 
in just such a, such a unique way. In, a, in any local church, we'll talk about Life Point because that's where we're sitting at, right? So think about the diversity that exists in Life Point. I mean, there's, there's so much diversity here, right? I mean, there's, there's people that come from different backgrounds. You, you came from, a, there's some here, you came from a home where your mom and dad stayed married all your life. You had a very stable upbringing. You went to church all the time and, and uh, uh, you, you learned about God and on and on and on. There were all kinds of, of things that you're just thankful for uh, because of the way God blessed you. As you've made your journey through life. Others of you, you came from a broken home. Some of you don't even know your biological parents. And your upbringing, your background is very different. So you, you weren't brought up in church. You didn't come to Christ until later on in life. Some of you still yet have, have you still not come to Christ. Others of you, uh, you... Uh, Maybe some of you, you come from a Baptist background or a Methodist background or Presbyterian or Lutheran or, or Catholic or whatever it might be. There's diversity. Some of you have, have a, a, a vocation that, that's very different from everybody else's. You're in a unique environment and, and God's just, just put you there. Or, uh, others of you, you're looking for a job. You, you've been in several different vocations and you don't have that kind of stability. There's all kinds of, even in the, in the church in our giftedness, we have different ways that we're wired. We have people that, that love to work with the youth. I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but there, I'm, I thank God for the people that want to do that. Uh, and uh, there's other people that are gifted to work with the children. And I told them the other two services, that's not me. If I were called upon to work with the children, I would give everyone a drink of Benadryl as they came down the steps. <laughs> because that'd be my way of dealing with it. <laughs> I don't know why your kid sleeps in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon. <laughs> but that would be my way. <laughs> I, that's, that's not, but I thank God for those people that do. I thank God for the, for the Angies that are passionate about discipleship, for the Carries that are passionate about worship, for others that are passionate about uh, uh, the, the evangelism, and on and on and on. I'm thankful for And we see it right now, what's happening in the church. There, there are people that are painting and working, volunteering, and, and doing so many things that I'm telling you, it just would not happen without people so, uh, being so sacrificial and doing so many things. I'm thankful for those people because I can't build anything. I can't do anything. I'm, I'm just not gifted that way. I don't, I don't have that ability. But I'm thankful for people that do. I'm thankful for the people that are a part of Celebrate Recovery. Do you know that we need, listen, it would not work in Celebrate Recovery to have a ministry for the people that are crying out in desperation if everybody that was a part of, a, of Celebrate Recovery had it all together. So if you're a person that has it all together and you don't have any problems and you've never had any failures and you've never broken down in life, don't come to Celebrate Recovery. Because we don't need you. We need the mess ups. We need the people that's been broken. We need the, the people that's walked through the failures. We need the addict, the former addict. We need the, the, the person that was formerly incarcerated. We need to be able to relate to that person that's going through a divorce. We need to be able to relate to that person that's going through the hurt, the habit, and the hang up because you've been there. That's so neat to see how God uses diversity in the body. Even as we sit here today. It just blows me away to look around and see people with a sweater on. Good golly almighty, is it hot in here. And then there's some people that say, oh, so it's cold. Diversity. But do you see how God can use diversity in His body? to bring together a group of people that can make a greater impact when that diversity is embraced instead of resented to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ because God put that group together for such a time as this. Do you see it? And that's exactly what God does. That's exactly what He's up to sometimes. God knew from the beginning of time that he was putting this group together and he orchestrated it. That's why we're here. Let, let me ask you, what, what's your contribution? Why are you here? Why are you drawing the breath of life? What's your purpose that God's given you? What's he want to do through you? Not what has he done through you. 
Everybody's talking about what, what happened years ago and what God's done in the past. Who's got the testimony of what God's doing in their life right now? Who's got the testimony of how real he is, what he's showing you, what he's convicting you about, what he's leading you to do, what he's taking you toward, what he's giving you a burden for? Who's got that testimony? I want to be that church. I want to be that person. And that leads us to the third thing, the opportunity of Esther. At first, Esther tries to excuse herself from any responsibility. In verses 10 through 12, when word gets to her from Mordecai, hey, you're the person that's in the place to do something. She says, you know what, I can't do it. If I try, if I go into the king's presence, anybody that went into the king's presence without permission would be killed. She said, I'll die. But Mordecai responds to Esther and says, well, listen, Esther, God's up to something. And you're in a place to get in on what God's doing and be a part of it. But here's, here's where the opportunity comes in. Here, listen to what Mordecai says to Esther. You, you have this opportunity, but if you don't take part in it, God's going to do it anyway. So are you going to get in on it or not? Ooh. This was her opportunity, and it's our opportunity. And we can say the same thing to each other. God's got some great things in store for this church. I believe that. God's got some great things in store for your lives. I believe that. The question is, are you going to take advantage of the opportunity and get in on it or not? Or are you going to look back and regret and miss the opportunity? Listen, God wants you. God wants you. Do you hear that? God wants you to be a part. God wants you in on this opportunity. But listen, God will work around you. Should you choose not to take part in the opportunity that he gives you, God will work around life point. Should we choose... Not to go on to the new things that he has for us. The opportunity is there. The question is, will we take it? A few things I want to remind you of to prepare you for the opportunities that God has for you, and they're this. First one's this. If you're going to be a part of the opportunity God has for you, accept who and where you are. In verse 15 and 16, Esther finally sees it. She recognizes. She's where she is by God's placement. And she's a servant. She says, okay. And she sees her opportunity and accepts it. Accepts her God-given assignment. And, he, and she lets God use her. You know, there are really two kinds of people in this room who say two different things. When you hear about this truth, that God has opportunities for you, God has a purpose for you, God has a plan for you, God, God throws it out there and says, come on, we, you want to be in on it or not? Or do you want to walk through life and just miss everything that I have for you? There are two people, two different people, two types of responses. The first one looks for an excuse. The second one looks for the opportunity. Are you a person that looks for the excuse how you can get out of it? Or are you the person that looks for how you can get in on it? I want to be that person that looks for my place to get in on what God's doing because I don't want to look back later in life with regret and brokenness because I dozed and I was numb to what was going on around me. And there was a God-given opportunity in front of me. And I missed it. Making excuses. I don't have time. I don't have ability. It's not my job. It's not what I want. Listen, there's no greater cause that anybody in this room could ever be a part of than the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, every person has an opportunity to be used by God in some way. And that is so unique. There are lives you can touch that I can't. There, there are situations that you have been through that give you a platform of opportunity 
that are unique to you. Do you realize that? And God says, listen, I've got you in the right place at the right time for the right reason. And I've got a right plan. And it's bigger than your comfort. And just giving you the opportunity to sit in the palace and eat bonbons. It's to be a part of the greatest cause on the face of the earth. And he says to us in the body of Christ, he says, I want you to, I want you to be a part of it. And I point you in the way that relates. Listen, there are things out there that God wants to do through this church, ways that he wants to touch this community, ways that he wants to minister, things that he wants to take us to that are totally dependent upon people recognizing their God-given opportunity, their, their God-given wiredness, their God-given uniqueness, their God-given diversity, and, and realizing how that can strengthen this body, this local church to give us the ability to make a greater impact. What's out there that Life Point still yet has, has yet to do that depends on you being here for such a time as this? <laughs> you know, I love, I love the book of Nehemiah too. Esther Nehemiah and Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi are the last books of the Old Testament chronologically. So after Esther, after the people are saved, and, Nehemiah, and Ezra and Nehemiah, the people go back and they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and they rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. I love the book of Nehemiah where God raises up Nehemiah to lead the charge, to rally the people, to, to go to what is said in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 18, to do the good work of God. Listen, anything you do in the church, anything you do to let God use you, it's a good work. It's the best work. It's the best thing you could be a part of. And anything else is really a waste of time. Nehemiah rallied them to a good work. And I love Nehemiah chapter 3 where the Bible just lists people one after another as they stood next to each other and rebuilt the wall. And if you read down through Nehemiah chapter 3, it's like this, that, that Kevin stood next to Tammy, who stood next to Kay, who stood next to Terry, who stood next to Mark, who stood next to Jaron, and they, they joined hands and they built the wall. It's a picture, the literal wording there is of open-handedness, working together in the midst of diversity because there were young people and there were old people. There were people from all different backgrounds but they accepted who they were. They accepted where they were and they kept the main thing, the main thing and they rebuilt the wall and stayed to the good work that God had given them to do. There's a couple of things there in chapter 3 and verse 5. The Bible takes time to say there, there was a certain group of people that in the Holman Christian translation, it says this, they didn't lift a finger to help. How would you like that to be your legacy? Oh, here's, here's God working and doing everything he wants to do, but Tammy didn't lift a finger to help. Whoever didn't lift a finger to help. John didn't lift a finger to help. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And there were others. They stood on that wall. And some of them, do you know the Bible even takes time to mention that there were, there were uh, certain individuals that repaired the wall next to the dung gate. In other words, where the sewer went out. Anybody want to volunteer for that job? But they did it. Because it wasn't about them. It was about recognizing who they were and where they were. Taking advantage of being a part of a great opportunity to rebuild the wall. And God used them. Great diversity. Great surrender. The second thing. You're going to be a part of great opportunity. Sometimes we just got to wake up and see what God's doing. And again, initially, Esther wasn't awake. She wasn't sensitive to the fact that God had her where she was for a purpose. And she needed a wake-up call. 
And sometimes we needed a wake-up call just to be awakened to the opportunities that, that exist around us. Listen, every day of your life, every day, I promise you, as you go out this week, God's up to something. God's doing something, and he's intersecting your life with somebody. The question is, are you going to be awake and see it? God's giving you an opportunity to be used. God's giving us an opportunity as a church to be used. Are we going to be awake and sensitive to and ready for the opportunities that he gives us? Because sometimes we just doze off. Like Esther, we're out, we're out of touch. And we got to wake up. Several years ago, there was, when Tammy and I were at church, uh, we'd been there a little while and started doing some things. And there was really some good things happening. But uh, the deacons decided to have a private meeting, and I wasn't invited. That kind of hurt my feelings. But uh, they, they said, we're going to meet. And they had their private meeting, got together. And in their private meeting, they, they discussed some things. They came back out, and they talked to me. And here's what they said. Here's what they told Tammy and I. We, uh, we want our church to stay the same. And these things that you're doing to, to lead us and to... Uh, help us to grow and to change. We don't want that. We don't want growth. Literally said it. We want things to stay just the same. And you either need to let up and change or leave. And so, I stayed. <laughs> uh, God's given me the gift of stubbornness. And, and so... <laughs> We worked through some things and God began to work. And God began to move, but it took going around the people that had planted themselves and were not awake to the times and the opportunities that God had given them. And he worked in spite of them. You know what? I don't want to be that person that God has to work around. I want to be that person that God works through. Don't you? I don't want to be the person that God has to work around me and around my attitude and around my junk and around my unwillingness and around my, my, the fact that I'm sidetracked and distracted and consumed with other things in my life. I want to be awake and sensitive to what God's doing and I hope you do too. There's opportunities around us every single day. The third thing is seize the moment, grab the moment. Mordecai was saying to Esther when he said, listen, you can get in on it or you can be worked around. But Esther, please, seize the moment. God's put you here for such a time as this. I love this statement that will come up on the screen. I love to go back to. What if our greatest fear was missing what God has for us? What if that was your greatest fear? What if that was our greatest fear as a church? Was missing what God has for us? Think of the difference that it would make in the way we serve the Lord and as we view life and we view our participation in the cause of Jesus Christ. I don't want to miss any opportunity that God has for me. I don't want to look back and regret. Listen, every, every parent in here knows what it is to look back and regret and, and have just that gnawing at you because you missed opportunities raising your children. You missed opportunities maybe sharing with someone or doing something that you know that God gave you to do, but now the door's closed. Listen, opportunities come and opportunities go, and they can be missed. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9, he talked about a great door for effective work. There's a door of opportunity before us and before you. Are you going to walk through it or not? Are you going to seize the moment or not? Billy Graham, in his book, Just As I Am, recounts this story. He had the opportunity to be somewhere with John F. Kennedy. And they were riding back in the presidential limousine. And JFK began to ask him about the things of Christ and specifically about the return of Christ. And Billy Graham shared with him. And they ended the conversation with JFK saying, that's interesting. Maybe we can talk some more sometime. 
Several months went by and they were at a national day of prayer. And they were leaving the, the national day of prayer and John F. Kennedy motioned to Billy Graham and said, hey, why don't you ride back in the presidential limousine with me to the White House and we can talk some more and pick up where we left off. And Billy Graham turned to JFK and said, uh, hey, you know what, uh, I'm kind of tired and I'm not feeling the best. Maybe we can do that some other time. And he didn't go. Several months later, a few months later rather, JFK was assassinated. And Billy Graham in his book, Just As I Am, said that conversation still haunts him to this day. That he had one more opportunity to seize the moment and share the gospel with the President of the United States and he missed the opportunity. Esther got to the place where in your last feeling, she put it all on the line for the cause of Christ. She said, if I die, I die. But she seized the opportunity. I don't know what your opportunity might be. I don't know what this moment might be for you. But I can tell you this. God doesn't promise us the next moment. God doesn't promise us another opportunity. This may be it. This moment in time that we have as a church con collectively, we may be in the very last days and these are our very last opportunities to reach a lost and dying world, crying out in desperation. But how sad it would be if we're out of touch. It may be the last opportunity for someone in this room to get something right with God. It may be the last opportunity this week that you have to share with somebody that you know needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe you've tried before. But God says, I'm going to give you another opportunity. I'm going to put that person in your pathway this week. Are you burdened? Do you see them? Do you care? Are you going to seize the opportunity? The Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation. This may be the last opportunity for someone in this room who knows that they need to be saved to be saved. This may be it. Are you going to take the opportunity? Or are you going to presume you're going to have another? You may, you may not, but you have this one. Will you seize the moment? Would you bow with me? As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, in this past service, in the second service, we had some that said, Kevin, this is my opportunity. I want to be saved today. Maybe there's some here in this service that say, Kevin, I, I've had the opportunity before. I've just put it off. And I know today is the day I need to be saved. I need to seize the moment and trust Christ as my Savior and surrender my life to Him. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you have this opportunity. Would you say yes to him? If that's you, anyone here that says, I want to trust Christ in this opportunity that God's given me, would you just raise your hand and say, Kevin, that's me. I want to be saved. God bless you. God bless you. Others. Anyone else? I want to be saved. I want to trust Christ. I want to surrender my life. Others of you, things aren't right. You're numb spiritually.
You're taking the opportunities for granted. And today you know you need to get things right with God. Would you? There's ways God wants to use you. There's things He wants to do through you. Would you let Him? It's all about surrender. It's all about saying, yes, Lord, I want to seize the moment. And let's be that church. Let's stand together.